Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called Jan Hammer the Charlie Parker of Jazz Fusion right this is going to be a contentious video I'm going to argue that um, not only is Jan Hammer one of the greatest musicians from this genre but actually his sound sort of embodies this genre more than any other musician that I can think of right um, this video was sparked by a conversation I really had with the incredible drummer Mark Mondesir, where he just turned around and he said to me, he goes, Jan Hammer's my man. Of course, Mark has played with Jan Hammer. And I agree, Jan Hammer's my man too, you know. Um, he has a very special place in my heart in terms of this genre, right? Um, if we step back and look at Jan Hammer's career, he's one of those really interesting musicians that's come out of jazz fusion, but he's greater than the actual genre itself. And I think when this happens for musicians, they don't get counted within the history of the genre. Another a musician that I think occupies that territory is the incredible Narda Michael Walden, right? Narda Michael Walden is, of course, one of the most important musicians in the history of this genre, but he's also one of the greatest music producers in the history of pop, popular music. He's also a solo artist in his own right who's had hit records. He's had a huge influence on pop music itself. And so as soon as you go to Narada, you hit that legacy. Jan Hammer is exactly the same thing. As soon as you go towards Jan Hammer, you hit that legacy. And that I want to deal with on this video as well. And I think because when you mention the name of Jan Hammer, it's like this. Oh my God, that's the guy that sold millions and millions with his soundtrack to Miami Vice. Right? Didn't he play like in a fusion band? Yeah, he was a keyboardist in the Mavish Doctor. Oh my God, that was that was really important too. And this discounts other things he did that if he was only a jazz musician, everyone would be shouting from the, the treetops what he did as a musician, right? Um, so I think Jan Hammer's importance to this genre, to the jazz fusion genre, is sometimes overlooked. I want to get into that. But where's this statement coming from? When I say Jan Hammer is the Charlie Parker of Jazz Fusion, well, what was Charlie Parker? What was Charlie Parker to Bebop? Now, someone's re recently put a comment up saying Charlie Parker was far more than just Bebop. It's the same thing. Charlie Parker's the same thing. Charlie Parker is more than just Bebop. His work with um, uh, Bird With Strings shows that he was doing so much more than that. But what Charlie Parker did to that genre was he was able to define the sound and phrasing of that genre. So there's a whole ton of musicians trying to um, forge a new sound in jazz, which is bebop. Um, Charlie Christian's very, very important to this, and around Charlie Christian coalesces a whole bunch of musicians, Kenny Clark, um, Thelonious Monk, and then later Dizzy Gillespie. And they're all trying to push the genre forward. But what they haven't got is the sound and the phrasing. Charlie Parker is a sound innovator. He changes the sound of the saxophone, right? And he, and he also redefines how you phrase. And the note choice. All of those things are redefined by Charlie Parker. And then people latch onto that. And that becomes the sound of bebop, right? That's what I mean by um, uh, uh, really defining the genre. Louis Armstrong was this, did this for jazz. <laughs> Louis Armstrong came in in the 1920s and really defined the sound of jazz. These musicians are few and far between. Now, is there a musician that did this for jazz fusion? Well, if you'd have asked me this before I really thought about it, I would say, well, that's John McLaughlin, isn't it? He, he did that. He creates the sound of fusion. He creates the sound of it. You know, everyone's trying to, trying to fuse it and they're doing it with greater and less success. But when John McGoughlin comes along with the Mavish Nuxia, he really defines it. And then everything after that is, is based upon that sound in some way. Um, that story isn't quite accurate in, for many reasons, right? And I think one of the things I've learned doing this channel is the Mavish Nuxia isn't the, the genius brainchild of John McGoughlin. And I think this is where the rows that happened within that band came from. The Mavish Nuxia was the genius product of five of the greatest musicians coming together and then all bringing something innovative into that band, right? This is not to discount John McGoughlin's input at all. It was incredible, right? Uh, I think Billy Cobham came in and he really shows that 
creates a different way of um, chopping up time, you know, which is the thing that I call additive time. Um, I think that uh, Jerry Goodman comes in and he really um, brings in a sort of classical, but also sort of Hendrix, you know, freak out rock approach to the band, which is so important. Rick Laird does the unenviable job of putting his ego to the side and being the bedrock on which is all founded. But Jan Hammer does something really special in the Mahabishan Orchestra, right? Jan Hammer um, came from Czechoslovakia originally. He was a virtuoso, sort of almost like a child prodigy that had a, quite a famous uh, jazz trio in Czechoslovakia when he was very, very young. Um, his mother was a famous jazz singer, so he's grown, gro grown up in the ja jazz um, genre from day one and the classical genre. He's a virtuoso musician. This guy can play jazz to the cows come home. All right? There's an album called Malani Malani that was recorded in 1968 when, when um, it's a live recording that Jan did when he was 20 years old. If you go listen to that, you can hear he's a virtuoso jazz pianist, very much like um, Chick Corea, very much like um, Joe Zawinul, you know, he, he's coming in from that angle. He gets a scholarship to Berkeley, which gets him out of Czechoslovakia, which by 1968, of course, is a communist country. And very quickly, he gets the gig at 21-22 with Sarah Vaughan. Do you know how much jazz chops you would have to have to get that gig? Right. So we have an out-and-out virtuoso jazz musician, okay? Then he gets, gets asked to do the gig with the Malvish Yorkshire. At this point, he's, he is also very interested in Indian classical music, and he wants a way of bending the notes in the same way that an Indian classical musician does. John McGoughlin's very interested in this as well, but John McGoughlin's also very much interested in the timing and the sound and certain chords. I I feel that the the melodic Phrasing and sound that is so important to the Mavish Nocturne really comes from Jan Hammer. All right. The phrasing and the sound. Okay. John McGoughlin's playing electric guitar. His, his, his influence and importance in changing the sound of jazz guitar is very important. He's, he's really coming out of Hendrix. He's using distortion. But it's not a sound that, is, is, that we haven't heard before. He's just applying it in a new context. Jan Hammer, though, is searching for a new keyboard sound. He originally tries to do this with electric piano and he tries to create devices where he can bend the notes with electric piano. But I think once the Moog synthesizer emerges, Jan Hammer is able to play this thing that he's got in his head. All right? And it's not a keyboardist emulating an electric guitarist. It's a keyboardist emulated Indian classical music approaches in terms of rhythmical divisions and timings and in terms of sound, right? And in those two areas, I think Jan Hammer creates a way of phrasing and, a, and, and an actual sound in itself, which is very specific. It's him passing a Moog synthesizer through a guitar processing unit and with the distortion and all that, being able to control that. If you listen to Birds of Fire, John McGoughlin comes in with, with a very emotional, incredible guitar solo, which really pulls at you. And it's really an amalgamation of Hendrix and uh, you know rock music with this, this new sound that they've come up with. But then when you listen to Jan Hammer's solo, Jan Hammer takes it to another level. And he is using you know um, uh, clusters of, of rhythms, fives and sevens built on top of each other. He's bending the note, he's using microtones. He's got that incredible sound, which sounds like a synthesized version of a sitar. And I feel that that sound that's in the Mavish Nocturne that then changes the way the melodies sound, right? And yes, that's the amalgamation of Jerry Goodman, John McLaughlin and Jan Hammer playing the melodies. But I feel that that sound's coming from Jan Hammer, right? I think he defines that. Why do I think that? I'll tell you why. It's because when the Mavish Nocturne stops, right, we don't hear that sound again from John McLaughlin. But we do hear it on Jan Hammer's solo albums. Jan Hammer 
carries on with the innovations that the Mahavishnu did far more than John McLaughlin did. The um, second Mahavishnu Orchestra with Narada Michael Walden and John Ponte is, an, is, a, is, a, is a completely different thing. It's, it's like a, a prog classical um, fusion with rock music, with Hendrix, with Miles Davis. That's what the second Mahavishnu Orchestra is. It's my favourite band of all time, as you know. But Jan Hammer carries on and on a series of albums takes the concepts that he developed in the Mav structure and he carries those on, right? Now, I believe that these albums he made, which would be the, the first seven days, Like Children, so it's Like Children first with Jerry Goodman, first seven days, Oh Yeah, Melodies, to some extent Black Sheep, those albums are some of the greatest fusion albums. He carries the genre on. And he, he, he goes deeper and in, deeper into creating this sound, right? Now, when I listen to a fusion band, right, if I go and listen to Return to Forever, right, yeah, they've amped up. But what's the big change in sound? It's Chick Corea's move over to synthesizers, all right? And where's he getting that sound from? He's getting that from Jan Hammer. If we listen to Joe Zamagel, Joe Zamagel starts out, he's playing electric piano, he's... Um, very ethereal, spacey, it's like a much more spacey version of Miles Davis. But on Sweet Nighter, he funks it up and he brings in the synthesizers, right? And the sound, now Joe Zawinul doesn't play synthesizers like Jan Hammer, right? Because um, he's an innovator himself. Chick Corea to some extent does. Uh, George Duke to some extent does. All the fusion musicians that come out have to deal with that sound. And it's that sound that makes fusion sound like fusion. It's Jan Hammer's phrasing, it's Jan Hammer's um, choice of notes and his sound and the way he uses the pitch wheel. That's the definitive sound of jazz fusion. It's on most jazz fusion albums. Um, it affects guitar players, it affects drummers. I was deeply affected by uh, the way Jan Hammer phrases as a drummer. Some musicians, um, they, they are strong enough to not succumb to that influence. Joe Zawinul is one. But still, it's a reaction to. And uh, again, even with that, Weather Report sound is so defined by the synthesizer. And the first guy to do that is Jan Hammer. Right? The, uh, the solo albums that he makes in the late 70s, early mid 70s to the late 70s, I think are the greatest of, of the genre. I, I, I'm rapidly moving to thinking the greatest jazz fusion album of all time is Oh Yeah by Jan Hammer. Um, that's a really contentious thing and most people find that really bizarre that I say that until I play it to them. And then when they heard He, he A Magical Dog, the first track on the album for the first time, they think, oh my God, yeah, this is, this is the peak. That, that's the peak of jazz fusion. But one of the things that Jan Hammer did in the 70s is he starts collaborating with other musicians. And his inputs into Jeff Beck's Wired and then the following live album is really, really important. That album sold millions and millions. So again, Jan Hammer comes out after the Mavish Structure, not necessarily with his solo albums, but with his collaborations with other musicians of carrying on this huge influence. For me, 70s jazz fusion, the sound is defined by this guy. Right For me, the, all the tracks I listened to, when I heard Wired for the first time and Lead Boots came on, and I heard that incredible drumming from Narada Michael Walden, the thing that was, I was dumbfounded by with that track was Jan Hammer's keyboard playing. I never heard that sound before. It was completely alien to me. Right, It was so funky and on it, and it was so free. And one of the things that really impresses me about Jan Hammer is his ability to put aside his jazz virtuosity and follow this new thing that he's innovated, right? He collaborates with lots of different musicians and this sound is, is a new sound. Um, if you check out the 1979 album, Hammer, he, which is, I find a really difficult album to listen to, he's exploring pop music. It's like a new wave album, that is. In the early 80s here in the UK, his um, Star Cycle track, which is a track that he wrote for Jeff Beck, turned up as the theme tune to the tube. We would hear this every week. And this was really interesting because suddenly a jazz fusion musician here in the UK was having this huge cultural influence. Everybody knew that sound. And it's the sound of Jan Hammer, right? Of course, then in the mid 80s, he gets picked to do the soundtrack to Miami Vice. 
Miami Vice, this is a, such an achievement and it's a testament to this sound. The reason why that Miami Vice soundtrack blew up, the reason why the soundtrack to Miami Vice, the album, sold 4 million copies, which is an instrumental album with Jan Hammer on, right, it's an 80s jazz fusion album. If that was classed as a jazz album, it would may well be the biggest selling jazz album <laughs> on the list of sold as much as Kind of Blue, if not more. There'd just be a few Kenny G albums that have sold more than that. We don't talk about those. Um, this, that is not down to the fact that Jan just happened to land the, the, the Miami Vice soundtrack and it was a success. There's a whole bunch of cop shows around in the 80s like that. Miami Vice, the success of that um, series is partly down to Jan Hammer's incredible sound. And his sound is all over that album. That's the sound. It's the sound. You understand that's what this video is about. I'm getting really worked up about it. It's the sound. It's Jan Hammer's sound. Jan Hammer's sound is like taking jazz fusion and condensing it down into a droplet and you get this droplet of sound and that sound is jazz fusion, right? And it's the thing that everybody loves. And when the general public got to hear it on Miami Vice, which is an instrumental, these are instrumental tracks, it sold four million copies. He then went on to do so many different soundtracks and so many different um, theme tunes, you know, that he is... His influence in music is far wider now than anything that can be encompassed within the jazz fusion genre. He's ploughed his own path, right? He is a phenomenal musician, right? This is the thing about Jan Hammer. He is a phenomenal musician. When I was preparing for this video, I decided to check out a couple of albums um, by Jan. And there's some incredible stuff out, you know, it's The Joy of Flying by Tony Williams, which he does some incredible uh, stuff on. Um, he does an album with Dave Sanchez, which is really rare. Not Dave Sanchez, sorry, with, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the guy. Let's gloss over that, I'll put it in the notes. Um, one of the, I, I went back and checked out um, the On the Mountain album by Elvin Jones. <laughs> This is an incredible album. And he's, he, he did three albums with Elvin Jones in the 70s. And um, he returns back to playing jazz, right? His jazz playing is utterly astonishing. He, if he had gone down that route, it would have been, he could have made piano trio jazz at the same level as a Keith Jarrett, without a doubt. And in fact, I find, because his phrasing and his signature sound is so great, Hearing back on a, a piano, playing straight jazz with Elvin Jones is an incredible thing. You know, uh, the fact that he didn't do that and that was there, that's the fundamental thing of what he does. But On the Mountain, that album, it's fully Anna Hammer compositions and he brings in the Moog synthesizer. And when you hear Elvin Jones playing, and it works so well, it marries up so well that you suddenly realise the heaviness of where Jan Hammer's coming from and how it is rooted in Coltrane and it is rooted in Miles Davis and it's all there. But what he was able to do was take that, package that up, right? Kick it into the future, which is what he does, nail it and then turn it into a com commodity that was then going to sell millions and millions of records. This is a huge achievement. This, and it's an achievement beyond anyone else I can think of in jazz fusion, right? Now, if you mention the genre, we go Mavish Nostra, which of course Jan Hammer's a really important part of, Returns Forever, Weather Report, 11th House, Brecker Brothers, Herbie Hancock. They're the names we mention. But I feel Jan, in terms of this genre, has not got the credit he deserves. And I think I've explained the reasons why. But for me, right, if I was to boil down the sound of jazz fusion, right? All the influences that are in there from Indian music to Latin music to rock music to classical music to jazz. If I was gonna try and boil all that sound and then, and then look at the innovations in terms of sound and phrasing, I think all of that is encompassed in Jan Hammer's sound and Jan Hammer's approach and Jan Hammer's compositions. So that is why I believe that Jan Hammer is the great representative, the great sound innovator of this genre in the same way as Charlie Parker was for bebop 
and that Louis Armstrong was for Jazz, right? This I'm, I'm making a case for Jan he here that he is one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. Right, let the argument commence, right? And I'm sure everyone's going to start telling me how important Chick Corea was, and I'm ready for it, and I'm, I'll do another video, because I'm ready for the argument, you know. Come on, we, this is what we're here for, isn't it? So, anyway... You all love these contentious videos, you know. I've I've staked my ground. I've got back up. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. So um, you know, bring it on, everybody. Jan Hammer, you know, I, I I'm, I'm he is truly one of the greats, if not the greatest. I'm gonna stop there. See you later.